August 9th, 2018. We're here at the Freiburg New Church Assembly. I will be offering our lecture this morning on loving our enemies. So as I get started, I'm going to pass these out. Um, if you would take a piece of paper, and then if you don't have a, if you just take it and then pass it behind you. That's okay. Okay. Just pass it around, please. If you already have a writing utensil, then you don't need to use a crayon or colored pencil, but that's what we have today. And um, you just put that somewhere, and we're going to be um, using that a little bit later as we go along. <coughs> So once those are all around, I'm actually going to ask you to do one more thing. And this time I'd like you to, if you do have a pen or a pencil, put it down. Um, if you have some knitting or something, you're, obviously we're all in freedom, so if you'd like to continue to do whatever you're doing, you may. But I'm going to invite you, if you wish, to do a meditation with me this morning to begin. So you just get comfortable in your seat. You might want to close your eyes. And I'm going to invite you to picture the Lord as the spiritual son, as we are taught, the Lord appears in the spiritual world. This warm, bright, huge sun in the sky that's emanating love. And I want you to imagine that this love is entering into you that the angels of heaven are always facing the sun and that that love comes into their bodies through their foreheads even. So imagine that great loving presence and that loving energy entering into your bodies, filling you with love, that love that created you, that love that sustains you every day, that love that flows through your body into the world, bringing joy and delight, comfort and peace, truth and justice. Just feel yourself infused with that love so that your body is almost vibrating with how full it is of the love of God. Now I want you to imagine to the right of you a loved one, maybe a spouse or a child, someone who you care for and who you have chosen in the world. And I want you to let that love that is vibrating in your own body extend to them. Let that love flow out of you and circle them so that you're connected. This love from God is flowing through you both, and you experience the delight and the joy of loving one another. And now to your left, I want you to picture community. Maybe the community of your hometown. Maybe the community of this Freiburg New Church Assembly. But a whole host of people who you are in relationship with and are connected to. Now picture that love that is coming out from the Lord and infusing your body is now encircling them. And embrace them with that, that love, energy, and warmth. See how the love that's coming through you from the Lord as it encircles your loved one and as it encircles your community only gets greater and more powerful flows out of you and into them. And now in front of you, I want you to picture an enemy. Maybe an individual who has harmed you in some way. Maybe a group of people that you feel anger towards and enmity towards. I want you to picture that enemy, and if you can, 
Imagine that love from God that is vibrating in your body, that is being shared with your loved one and your community. Imagine that love encircling them. vibrating amongst all of these persons and you. I invite you to just take a minute to observe this experience and then as you're ready you can come back into the room. So as we begin, enter this space, hopefully continuing to feel that vibrating love through our lecture this morning. I'd invite anyone to share um, a comment about what that was like, that meditation. Were there parts of it that felt really good, parts that were hard? Anybody have a comment at all? harder to picture some think of someone to, to picture. Okay. Yeah, I mean I think that was the hard part. I think like I don't think I just had to tell the right guy or anything. I know. I definitely had an enemy. You picked one, okay. <laughs> and how was she it? She walked wide up. Uh-huh. And um, I was surprised to have the love flow between us. She was shining too. So Roz was saying that she your enemy was shining as well. Yeah. The love was reciprocal. Yeah. Anyone else? Anyone? Well, I'll just share that um, the first two parts of the meditation felt really good, obviously, mm -hmm. to me. Um, finding the enemy was not hard at all because I've had a fresh enemy mm -hmm. <laughs> recently. But, and I tried, I have to say I tried to feel like circling her. And I imagined her smiling. But there was something that just came and blocked that. Mm -hmm. I, I just had that experience. Like I'm not ready to, to forgive this person quite yet. Sure. So there was a, a block. She did. And also she represents uh, a group of medical bureaucracy stuff. So it's like an individual and a hospital that makes mm -hmm. a really poor decisions, I believe, in terms of how they're going to be offering that care. So sort of a collective enemy. Yes. <laughs> up a shield between me and them mm -hmm. to to protect me but also to the other people. Oh yeah. This is something similar to Red Wing. It was sort of a barrier. Yeah. So at this upgrade, oh, one I more. The, I noticed the color shift mm -hmm. at different times. The original <clears throat> image was yellow. The sunlight was a love that was yellow. And when I share that with the community, it turned green. Mm. And when I shared it with my enemy, my enemy was surrounded by a white light mm. and then a yellow ring around that. I don't mm. know. Maybe these, these reflections maybe help me yeah. understand what that is. So um, the next thing
thing I will invite you to do if you wish, uh, the reason I handed out your pieces of paper is I love for in insights to be practical. So um, if you wish, you could either write the name down of the enemy that you pictured. Maybe you want to draw a picture so that you don't share that information with other people. It's your choice. Um, but if you'd like, you could write the name down of or the or a picture to represent whatever the enemy was that you that you imagined in this meditation. And then as we go through the lecture, I'll be inviting you to think of some practical ways that we might be able to love that enemy a little better. So um, I just want to read the scripture that I'm going to be focusing on. And uh, obviously, I'm, I'm guessing everyone has heard this before. This comes from the Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel of Matthew. And it's only a very small portion. Um, there's a lot more about the specifics of loving your enemies, but I'm just going to focus on uh, chapter 5, verses 43 to 48. So Jesus says on the Sermon on the Mount, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what, re what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father So, um, I want to start with the question, why should we love our enemies, other than because Jesus told, we should, told us that we should? Anyone have any thoughts on why we should love our enemies? don't love them, then they'll always be our enemy. Right. Nothing will change. There's no possibility of change or transformation if we don't love them. Um, I'm just going to offer one thing which uh, is definitely a part of the scripture, you know, this idea of be perfect as your Father in Heaven is perfect. I often struggle with the word perfect. But, um, in our Swedenborgian cosmology, we imagine that we, along with everybody else in the creative world, are affected by two realms, right? Hell and heaven. And that from these two realms, we are recipients of love and gentle whispering of angels and inspiration, and joy from heaven. And that we are also recipients of proddings and nudgings and sayings and words from hell. And we kind of exist in the middle, um, making a choice between what we will receive and what we will act on. And there are different models of this, but this is the one I like the most because Swedenborg describes things in paradoxical ways. But I've often seen the, the model that around all of this, so there's the heavenly realm, there's the hellish realm, then God is around all of it. And you kind of get that um, idea from this scripture reading where the God causes the sun to shine on the evil and on the good, the rain comes down on all of us. That God is, is sending love to all of this, all of these realms, and holding all of these realms. So in a sense, when we love our enemies, we are we are seeking to be perfect like God, where we are we are sharing God's love in the whole mix of 
our experience. Um, this was actually one of, there are several different doctrines in the Sweet Origin Church that initially said, oh yes, this is my community, but this was one of them. Um, this idea that we are all influenced by heaven and hell and that the church is not about the righteous being set apart from the unholy, but instead the acknowledgement that we all have holiness in us and we all have unrighteousness in us. I often, sometimes you hear the complaint from people who don't go to church. They complain because they say that church, they're all saying they want to be good and love God, but they're arguing amongst each other and they're, you know, they're not always nice and shouldn't they be better than the rest? And I say, no. <laughs> I mean, we're not better than the rest. Nobody is. It's, it's, we don't go to church so that we can be separated from other people or so that we can lift ourselves above them. We go to church because we're in the mess too. And we find the church to be a place where we can do the work of sorting these things out, where we can find community with other people who are like-minded to do this hard work of finding ourselves and looking to God in the mix of the hellish and heavenly influences that we are a part of. And I really found that to be pretty powerful. Because, um, there's such a history of the church, especially Christianity, saying we know and we are a part of it. If you know, then you'll be good. And, then, and obviously we've seen how the perversions can come from that. When anybody lifts themselves up as totally holy, it's a pretty big fall when it's found out that, no, actually, those people are human, too, and they also can be prone to hellish influences. So when we love our enemies, we're loving the heaven, we're loving the whole person. We're acting like God and loving and sharing the love from God um, within our perfections and our imperfections, within our strengths and our weaknesses, um, and all parts of creation everywhere. To me, that's one of the motivations of loving our and en loving our en enemies. Um, and I don't I don't know uh, how you feel, but we certainly learn that love is powerful, right? That love has power and reality, but that evil sort of dissipates. It doesn't actually have a life of its own. And in the same way, hate. While it feels very powerful in this world, it doesn't have the power that love does. So if we bring love to um, an enemy, to a painful part of our own experience, um, even something within us, you can imagine that that love is probably going to be a little bit more effective than our hate. All right. Uh, the next thing I want to ask us to do together is, so what makes somebody our enemy? Any ideas? Aaliyah? When they try to hurt us? Anything else, Ken? When they hurt someone that we care about hurt us or, us, or someone else? Make somebody our enemy or a poor group of people our enemy? Dishonesty. They control us, they don't allow us any freedom. Uh, someone who takes away our freedom. Kind of a difference that we can't get past. We just don't see eye to eye and 
So it's just that maybe something we care about so strongly that their difference really offends, offends our sense of right and wrong. Or the difference we can't get past. The difference, you know, people, everybody has a different level of what they can get past. Right, right. So if somebody has the goal or intention of hurting someone, that can make them your enemy, even if they don't actually do it. Yeah, or the goal of, of doing it. think of our enemies, I find it for someone who is, is becoming an enemy, um, I, I find this diagram to be really helpful to think about what is it, on what level are they my enemy? Are they my enemy because they have done harm to me? Which, you know, I, in preparing this, I think about like the, the places I get the most angry and sometimes it's, I think I let myself be the most angry in traffic because I live in Boston and so <laughs> when I drive, I, you know, and, and it's, it's a very impersonal enemy because I don't know that who is that person's driving, but it's, it's the red Toyota that is cutting me off or driving improperly. They should be in the left lane. I mean, I'm very fixated. And the, so they become my enemy, but it's really just because they're inconveniencing me. It's a very selfish um, enemy uh, that I've created. But then some of these examples might be more about our neighbor and how, how we feel our neighbor is being treated whether our neighbor is being harmed in some way. Maybe we have an enemy because of how, the wor how a person is treating the world. I certainly can feel that way about especially corporations or um, you know, collective individuals that are doing harm to our planet can become an enemy. Um, or maybe it's more societal en enemies about how healthcare is being managed or you know, these bigger decisions in the world. And then of course there's enemies um, that we are created and we would see that the, whatever they have done has actually been a travesty against God. Which, that's a pretty um, high one. But, um, and I wonder when you think about the enemies that you've pictured, which realm do you think they are acting on? Does anybody want to share? Could you speak a little bit more about what you just said about the Lord? Um, I didn't say much about it because I, I think it's a little bit hard to get your head around. I mean, I think traditionally, some people would say an enemy is someone who is, you know, profaning the Lord or teaching a doctrine against the Lord. But I, I personally think that's a little bit too limited. I, I think of more about so what's 
if you have if you have a belief in a divine law and you believe that person has really broken a divine law, something that that everyone would agree that it, even if you really tried to have perspective, everyone would agree, you know, this really um, whereas this would be a more worldly law. And as we know, worldly laws change. There used to be different ideas about what was just and than there are today. Um, I ask because I think most of my anger comes here. I don't think I'm that evolved. I think I get angry most of the time when I'm being hurt in some way. Um, or maybe my family or friends. Um, but it's, it's, it's a little bit different when it gets up to these higher problems. But I think it's helpful to think about where our enemies, they are those who oppose us, who harm us, who hurt the ones we love, um, destroy what we love. And when we have an enemy, um, sometimes we might, you know, fully embody, that person is fully our fully embodied enemy. We, we don't see anything good about them. We see that, that human being and their behavior is opposed to us and we are completely, they're completely that, that is the enemy. That's sort of the, the highest realm of enemy. But then maybe there's the, like, the red Toyota, like, I don't really know that person, but I'm just, this behavior is my enemy what they're doing. And I think sometimes, you know, this morning my four-year-old was my enemy when he <laughs> wouldn't get dressed. So there's a, there can be um, people, there can be situations where we are in the experience of, of dealing with somebody who's opposing us. And we may not believe that that, I mean, I certainly don't think he's my enemy, he's my beloved child, but that experience is one where there is enmity, where there is conflict. And a lot of what I want us to think about this morning is how do we behave in those situations? Because it's one thing to be kind and altruistic when others are being kind and altruistic to us. It feels good. You pat my back, I'll pat yours. We're in the beloved community. Everything is flowing. It's joyful. It's great. It's a very different thing to be kind and altruistic when someone is opposing us. Um, so we talked about heaven and hell and the influence on how that influenced us. And another thing about heaven and hell is that um, they are governed by different laws. So as we might imagine, heaven is governed by, what do you guess, the law of, one word starts with L. <laughs> Love. So heaven is a beloved community where we are circling each other and loving each other. Hell is governed by the law of retaliation. We talk a lot about how in our understanding of hell, people are not, you know, cast, God is not down there doing the punishing. We're, we're not cast into a pit where God is uh, whipping us with a lash, we're kind of cast into a pit of people like ourselves who want our most selfish needs to be met, who do harm on others, and as they do harm on others, harm is done to them again and again and again, over and over and over and over, and that is hell. It's this law of retaliation that if someone hurts me, then I must hurt them back. And this is a pretty primal feeling, is it not? I watch it all day long with my sons. <laughs> if somebody hits me, I have to hit them back. If somebody hurts my feelings, I have to hurt their, them back. And sometimes, obviously, it's not even that straightforward. It's somebody hurts me, I feel hurt, now I have to hurt someone else. Which often is not how it plays out. This, this is how hell is managed and how hell operates, and we, we can see how that functions in this world as well with that very primal, natural impulse to hate our enemy, to lash out when we're harmed. Um, this is what the hellish spirits would like us to do. Um, and they get their way a lot of the time in this world. But part of the reason we're here is we, we want to look to what God wants for us, and we want to lift ourselves above that most primal and basic tendency, and to seek to operate from this law of love. As much as I hate the word, we are here to seek to be perfect as God in heaven is perfect. And that, that's calling us to associate 
not with the hellish spirits that would wish us to retaliate and have revenge on those who hurt us, but with the heavenly angels who would seek to call us to, um, to love. Um, and I think uh, Hugh actually read some of this in his chapel service this morning. Um, the heavenly angels want only the good for everybody, even the evil, even the, the most evil spirit. And sometimes that good is through punishment or um, setting up rules. Um, it's and, and at the basic level, the way Swedenborg writes it is, the heavenly angels want to instruct and lead all beings to the Christian good. To good, and so um, even the enemy, <clears throat> especially the enemy sometimes. So, um, the next thing I want to talk about in relationship to this is to disclose any private information, the things that you get angry about, the things that have enemies that you've made, I wonder if you're able to think about which realm they are connected to. We sort of brought this up at the beginning, um, but I wonder if we can really practically hammer it down. Does anybody have a sense of their enemy and uh, um, an example of, and maybe don't make it yours, an example of an enemy and what it might, which realm it might relate to? Ken? Well, 
Colgate's suggesting that the anger itself might be evil, that there's no way when we are angry because we're so emotional to be discerning. Well, that's what the hell is one, is that, that, that guy doing that thing is their manifestation. So there's like the love pouring in there, death pouring in. Mm -hmm. That's its way in. I, um, I think what you're saying, Colgate, is sort of very true. Obviously, there's a doubt there's a whole lot of angels up there being angry at each other. The heavenly state is one of peace and listening and compassion, and the hellish state is, this, is, is more of this battle and opposition. Um, and so in the state of being angry, we don't have a lot of discernment. And so I think you're right. We need to sometimes step away. It takes a lot. And... I would, I would maybe argue a little bit because I do think there's something about the power of that feeling that helps us to see when our love is being harmed. That if we didn't get angry, then we might not do anything. When we see um, damage being done to our neighbor, to our world, that there's power in that feeling. And maybe it's just the power to wake us up so that we then go off and have discernment. But, uh, and maybe it's one of the ways that the hells are used. You know, Swedenborg says a lot that everything is put to use in this world, hellish and heavenly. Um, but I, I, I really, have, I've done a lot of work about anger <laughs> the last couple of years, and I do think there's something about righteous anger to, um, to give us the energy we need to act. I definitely think it can be abusive and it can go out of control. So it's, it's, a, it's like playing with fire. Uh, Martha? Gentle whisperings and 
Sometimes they do. But we're learning all the time, and our anger is a real indicator of where we are and what we care about, what we love. It shows us what we love because it shows us what is being harmed. And I do think that it's important when we're angry to, to get a step away and think about why, um, but also to, to respect it. You know, it, it's interesting. Um, sometimes anger is given. You know, if you're angry, you, I'm not going to listen to you if you're angry. You know, sometimes we might have that attitude. Um, and I just have to bring this in because I, I heard about this study recently where they, they studied how men are perceived when they're angry and how women are perceived when they're angry. And like with a completely, you know, nothing to do with hair color or any personality, they discovered that men are listened to more when they're angry and women are listened to less. On a very, pretty strong scale, which I have to really think about. But anyway, so we, we don't always respect anger, but sometimes we do. Sometimes we perceive it as righteous. We say, oh, if that person's angry, that's because they're having a righteous anger and they really care about the situation and they really know. But sometimes when we see someone angry, we think, what's wrong with that person? They must really, and, and sadly, that differentiation often happens between men and women. If a woman is angry, it must be her time of the month, or it must be she's this. Whereas if a man is angry, he must be righteously caring about this thing, which hopefully we're starting to change those, those, those things. So, so we see that anger can have power if it gives us that, that energy and that, that care of the situation to really stand up and tell the truth. Um, but it can also cloud our thinking and make us unreasonable um, and unable to be heard. Um, we're getting close to our time. So the last, looking, go back to your little pieces of paper. So we, we've talked a lot about all of this and we haven't gotten to many specifics, and I, I apologize. But I hope that um, from this, your takeaway may be, one, that your anger is giving you information. Um, so not to just me, that means every time I'm angry, that must mean I need to do something. But every time I'm angry, I can think about what is it that's being harmed? What is the love that's being harmed? And is this a love that's just really selfish and has nothing to do with the larger world? Or is this a bigger love that really deserves some attention? that I'm being called to help make some change with. Um, and then also to think about how we're all in this framework of heaven and hell. We're all responding to hellish and heavenly influences. We are all imperfect. I'm guessing that all of us have at one time, perhaps, been an enemy to another. Are you willing to guess that maybe somebody in this room has thought of you as an enemy, if not totally and completely in a moment of being opposed on an issue or a situation. Maybe you've said the wrong thing or done the wrong thing. Maybe. <laughs> we all, you know, we are human beings together and we are bumping up against each other and we are all prone to making um, bad choices. Um, and I think to acknowledge that really can help us when we're dealing with an enemy to have that compassion on another as we would on ourselves. Um, also, and, and that allows us to separate the injustice that we've experienced from the person as a whole. And to really have that, that compassion. You know, I was, we don't have time, but I was going to do the meditation again, and this time have us picture something we love about ourselves, kind of what other people love about us, and kind of sharing that love, and then what is the enemy with it? Because the truth is, we all are prone to certain hellish influences and voices. We maybe all kind of do dumb things a lot of the time or are unable to handle certain situations. And if we have that enemy within and we respond to that with hate, I hate myself because I do this, I hate myself because this is a part of me, that's gonna be a lot less effective than to have compassion with ourselves for that wrong. And if we can have that self-compassion for the ways in which we have said yes to hell at times in our lives, then we, I believe that there's also a correlation between how compassionate we can be with others who have made those mistakes. And in terms of how we respond in the moment, it's all the stuff we talked about in my lecture last time that Nancy has in her notebook, if you'd like to refer to it. <laughs> we can love each other in a myriad of ways, whether that means drawing a boundary, whether that means um, teaching, whether that means love, you know, 
love is going to look a myriad of ways, and it will look different to someone who has harmed us. We're not going to necessarily love them in the same way. But we are called to love them and not to retaliate, because it will only, as Gard brought up, make things much worse. So I guess we'll end there. And if there's any, I guess we have no time. One minute, no time. All right. If you want to talk about this later, we can talk about it later. But thank you very much. Thank you.